Hello, this is David Thompson from the Fraser Valley in British Columbia with a message for all those that are hungry and thirsty for ultimate reality, for meaning and destiny in your lives. It goes on without end, ever enlarging and creative fulfillment unique to you. It is the very reason for which all things consist and exist. It is not something just to believe in that is a religion. It is reality, and there's all the objective evidence, irrefutable evidence from many fields of science and archaeology, also confirmed subjectively by subjective experience in one's personal life and in seeing people from every background completely transformed those that were once criminals, those that were very noble and deceived, and everything in between. People from every background, from every religion, totally transformed into a new creation by the power of God's love. There's a lot of belief systems nowadays, but what is their fruit? The fruit is death, hate, corruption. People believe in things that aren't backed by objective reality, that are destructive to their own lives and destructive to the people around them and their nation. Look at the belief systems we've seen in recent history with Nazism. Look at what's manifesting today that's even worse than Nazism because they broadcast their evil atrocities that they've done an innocent, righteous people, terrible torment that is from the pit of hell. And they advertise it unashamedly and brazenly. This the Nazis did not do, although they were very, very hellish from the pit of hell. So, this is the opposite message. This is the true good news that has existed from the very beginning of time. In fact, it existed before the world was created and the universe was created. I'll have to explain that to those that are new and I may as well say right now, for those that are new, I am speaking broadly to everyone in the world at this introduction part of the message. And I want you to be aware that I have a website at ultimatemeaning.com where you will find a flip book with original writing by the gifting of the Spirit of God through me that answers the very hardest questions and some of the answers are very unique that you will not find anywhere else that are very effective answers to the hardest questions. There is a lot of print that is highlighted in red and those are links to many videos that show from every field of science and archaeology the reality of what I'm sharing here. These are videos that the vast majority of the public does not know anything about, and if they saw it, they would be, in many cases, absolutely surprised and awestruck. So you check it out yourself. If you're thirsty for reality, and you want what's real and what's true, and not just mere religiosity, in the sense of what the sociological meaning of that word is, which is basically people that believe in something that's delusional, and that is a crutch and that means that they become divisive to others and that they believe things that are to their own detriment. Of course, just in this temporal little world. Yeah, that's the sociological meaning of the word religious nowadays that people have in their mind. Oh, that person's religious. No, what I am sharing is not in that sense at all. It is reality. I want to share with you about this message briefly to those from whatever background you are. First of all, you will find on my website at ultimatemeaning.com also some really good YouTube videos, one where I debate a, or I respond to the debate of a renowned atheist showing the absolute bankrupt arguments that 
he is giving, he was ba debating someone else, but I took that video and interjected myself, creating another video. So you can see that, and you can see all the evidence on that flip book with many videos. So I have the most positive, meaningful, optimistic message for you, and the fact is it is backed by the evidence far more than all the lies and delusions that don't have any evidence that say they have the facts but when you check it out they don't have the facts they're liars they're deceivers deceiving their own selves let the blind lead the blind into the ditch forget about them let's find out what is real, what can go through the testing fires of truth and come out the other end on skate. And that is good news. What am I talking about? What is the ultimate meaning? What is the reason for which all things consist and exist? It is summed up in one word, but it must be defined because there's many misconceptions of what this word means. And it is summed up in this one word, love. Now, if you look at the word love, for example, in the Greek language back in the time of uh, Christ and so on, back in those times, there's three meanings for the Greek word. There's eros, which is sexual. There's philia, which is the love of feeling and emotion, and your soul, and so on. And then there is agape, which is the highest form of love. And I want to define that love for you. It is a quality that always chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. Freely, innately always chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. Obviously, any lesser choice would have a measure of corruption in it. This love has such integrity and purity that, as it were, it is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to love. That's the first aspect of this love. You can call it the holiness of love, or the integrity of love, or the purity of love. It is the defensive aspect of love. If love condones what is contrary to love, it ceases to be love. No, this love is not only the opposite of corruption, it is the destroyer of corruption. And the one true God is love, and this is the first aspect of his love. It is represented in the negative symbol, and the positive symbol will be explained later. The negative symbol in math and electronics and in all of nature. What does that negative symbol represent? It represents an indestructible foundation of reality from which can spring forth creation without corruption ultimately in its ultimate end. It also represents cutting off all corruption. Now, it is out of the negative symbol that has formed the positive symbol, which is also the symbol of the cross as we know it today. But I want to point out to you that the symbol of the cross did not only exist at the beginning of Christianity, existed from the very beginning of the history of the world. Because the most ancient languages, which use symbolic letters from the Mideast, there were many different languages like the Phoenician and the Hebrew way back 1500 BC, 2000 BC and earlier. And the last letter of their alphabet was the symbol of the cross just as we draw it today, and it meant a sign or a symbol. And we know that the cross is formed by crossing out the negative symbol that I just described, which is the first aspect of love. But this love is so great in its perfection in the negative symbol, it is ultimately expressed in this, that God's love is so great that he could condescend to this little planet and become a human being just like us mere creatures. Yes, he's great enough to communicate with his creation. Oh, some people think, oh, how dare you make God like a man? 
No, how dare you limit God that he doesn't have the greatness to be that great, to come down in human form and communicate with man. And not only that, to become a perfect, atoning, substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, which he did through Jesus Christ. His death was prophesied, some prophecies over a thousand years before he came, in detail that he would be pierced and so on. In fact, in Zechariah, it talks about when he returns and the nation of Israel finally recognizes him as the Messiah in Zechariah 12. And it says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And me is referring to the most sacred name of God, which is Yahweh or Yehovah, as some like to pronounce it, which is not as accurate. That is a prophecy that will be fulfilled after two thirds of the nation of Israel as all the nations come against her, are captured and tortured. But that one third, at that point in time, God returns in Jesus Christ upon the earth and the Mount of Olives will split in half and the wicked will be destroyed that came against Israel and around the world as his presence fills the world with glory, it will cause the wicked that breathe the air in to be burned to ashes. And there will be a massive earthquake that will literally crumble all the towers of the earth. It is really very clearly prophesied in Isaiah 33 and in many places in the book of Revelation and other places in Isaiah that this will happen as the Yahweh, the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit return to the earth. And so I want to share with you that that second aspect of this love is so great that God humbled himself more than you, a mere creature, and he suffered more than you, a mere creature, on the cross. So that you could choose to repent and receive his forgiveness and mercy. And this message was not just from the time of Christ on. It was from the very first parents, Adam and Eve, that there is only one God and that only God has the power to forgive sins. The message was right there. Adam and Eve and, and the others, Abel and so on, took an animal sacrifice, a lamb, put placed their hands on the head of it, a symbol of their sins being transferred on to that lamb. And it was slain because they recognized their sin and they needed atonement for their soul. They needed a substitutionary sacrifice. But they recognized that the animal wasn't the source of forgiveness, but God. In fact, in Micah 6 in the Old Testament, it says even if you gave your son as a sacrifice to God, it wouldn't be sufficient to cleanse you of your sin or to make atonement for your soul because an animal can't represent the soul and the spirit and the brain and the mind of man. It can only represent the flesh. And so the flesh could be cleansed before the time of Christ allowing God's spirit to not indwell their soul and spirit, but to dwell with their soul and spirit, bringing a new creation into their inner being. But after Christ died on the cross, the soul and the spirit was cleansed, and now God could imbue and indwell with his presence within us. And Christ prophesied about this in John, believe it is chapter 5, he said, whoever believes with their life into me out of their innermost being would flow rivers of living water. And he's talking about the Spirit of God, the invisible energy of the life of God dwelling in your inner being, the life that rose Christ from the dead, who was seen by more than 500 at one time. And four lawyers set out to try to disprove the resurrection of Christ by writing books and in the process found the evidence so strong that they were converted. The most recent one was Lee Strobel. Check him out. He's written the case for Christ and many other books. But this message even existed before the world was created. Because there are verses in the Bible that says that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world or before the create world was created. It was beyond time. And I want to explain for those that think that Christians believe in three gods that no, genuine Christians don't believe in three gods. But we're to 
But for God to be almighty, he must rule in the three ultimate aspects of existence, which are beyond time and space, beyond creation, and in creation is the second aspect, and filling all creation and omnipresence is the third aspect, as well as on to the Father beyond time and creation. And as the Father, he is known as the originator, the creator, it is God the Father. Yes, you have to be in conscious intelligence to rule in that ultimate aspect of existence as the Father. And the Son is the word Son is expression. And Jesus Christ is the one and only expression of the Father, the exact and full expression of the Father into the creation realm to experience it and communicate with what he has created and do as he did on the cross. And God, the Holy Spirit, an omnipresence and able to do creative activity everywhere at the same time, including raise the dead or whatever. Oh, I don't want to get into all kinds of other things I could talk about scientifically to back all of this up for time. This is a brief introduction to the truth that will set you free from bondage. You know, it says of Israel when they were in rebellion against the truth that they had of who God is. It says you've hewn out for yourselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. When we grasp after temporal lying things that only satisfy us for a moment in time and then leave us empty, we are like broken cisterns grasping after something that will not fill the void that was only meant to be filled with God, for you were created with a God vacuum. I am here to share the good news with you. That you can have the love of God shed abroad in your inner being. His life, his power, his presence. You can know peace in the inner depths of your being. Reality in the inner core of your being because the ultimate reality, which is who God is, can abide in you when you repent of your sins and make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. And so I've shared with you briefly the good news. And yes, because God the Father is beyond time and space, it was not just a capacity in God before the creation of the world. It was a reality that it already happened, that Christ came and died and rose again. Hard for you to comprehend, I know. Of course, it's hard for anyone to comprehend that. You know, particle physics reveals... Before I get into particle physics, actually, I want to say this about the love of God. That there is no love that can be imagined that is greater than the love that I just described. And there is no love that could exist that could be greater than this love that I just described that God would love you as an individual so much that he would humble himself more than you and suffer more than you on the cross. Now, I've written a book that will further explain this, which you can get on Amazon. It's titled Afterlife, Incredible, Irrefutable. It is a large 368-page, six-by-nine paperback book. And it goes into particle physics and the mathematical analysis of it, showing all of these dimensions that are superior to the third dimension, which is what we are in, in this physical realm. The fourth dimension is far superior to the third and the fifth to the fourth and so on, all the way up to the tenth. It's possible, it's possible some believe that there could be even more. And that's what highly accurate mathematical analysis shows, and I have that information in this book and people time and time again when they die on with medical equipment there and doctors there some have been dead for almost two hours like Dean Braxton they describe 
the details of what the doctors were talking about, what songs they were listening to or singing, what they were doing, what their relatives were doing in the hallway nearby or miles away in their home. It's all been verified and it's happened over and over again when the doctors know there is no brain waves and a totally heart totally stopped with some almost two hours long. This repeats itself over and over again. And Dean Braxton, you can look up his name on YouTube, B-R-A-X-T-O-N is the last name. Type in N-D-E's at the beginning, which stands for near-death experiences, and the name Dean Braxton. And he describes in one of his YouTube videos, standing before Jesus Christ, and many have experienced what he has experienced, such as Dale Black and Randy Kay and many others. And what does he describe? A love in that dimension that is so much greater than anything you can experience in the physical dimension and is of such greater fulfillment and pleasure than anything like sex in the physical realm. It's nothing compared to the love you're experiencing in this realm. It was so intense that he knew that it was a reality that if Jesus Christ had only created him, God and Jesus Christ would have humbled himself more than him, suffered more than him on the cross so that he could choose to repent and be reconciled to God and become part of the everlasting family of God in heaven, which exists with myriads of angels from myriads of creations and planets of the universe, myriads of only one quarter of the angels are human-like, by the way. They're all extremely very majestic and very different looking. This is known by many people. Dean Braxton talks about this and many others. So you can get that book, Afterlife Incredible Irrefutable, on the internet. I want to explain to you how great this love is and that you can receive it. And now it is time for me to more specifically address the churches gathered around Jesus Christ throughout the world and especially across the United States and across Canada. So I want to say that these messages are not given with preparation of very limited preparation. I don't have any notes here. I just speak from my heart. And the reason for that is because I seek to speak these messages prophetically. Because the Word of God says in 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. We are to always seek to allow the Spirit of God to speak through us. Especially when we as believers are gathered together and yet it is so slightly practiced and facilitated by leadership and by people in congregations today. And so I have written a book titled Godheadship and Body Invasion because one of the messages God is bringing to the body of Christ today. And I don't know if I have one of these books with me right now. But it's titled God, Headship, and Body Invasion. I took them and put them all in the car the other day. Because I was going to give some. Oh, here's some down here. Uh, oops, that's... I'll get the right one here. Okay. This is basically... It's got a different cover now. It's similar, but different. God, headship, and body invasion. Because God wants to bring a great reformation into churches across the United States and Canada and around the world. Now, I don't have time to go into detail about this right now. But I want to say this, that he is calling for local assemblies, whether small or great, to not limit the fullness of the headship of Christ from an from indwelling your gatherings. He's also wanting it to be so in your lives personally. And I would suggest that across the nation of Canada and across the United States, 
that churches come together in their community or city and town to fast and to pray for three days, and to cry mightily on to God and to rend their hearts, and to mean business with God and to wake up, and to repent of loving the gods of amusement, that is, watching sports for hours instead of a life of prayer, to repent of wasting time on things that are idle when the word of God commands us to redeem the time because the days are evil, to repent of giving yourself to material pleasures and materialisms and other things and putting things of this world first so that your heart is hard and so there's a denominative mindset and heart set that causes division and that also causes divorce and adultery and also to never go back to being the church the way you were. And even if you didn't come together to fast and pray, you should do this right now in your church. Quit making, having your church just comfortable in being the way it is. Most of the pre-service prayer meetings in churches today are ill-attended. I suggest you don't have a pre-service prayer meeting. You make your church service a prayer meeting. And you get on your faces and on your knees before the living God and utter awe of whose presence you're in. And you become sensitized to Christ and more conscious to Christ in your midst of but around whom you're to gather instead of the pastor at the front and those that are leading. And you pray maybe a half an hour or an hour. And then you facilitate fully each member of the body to function in the gifts of the Spirit as they sense the Spirit of God rising in them to give a word, whether it's a word of exhortation or a spontaneous song that is prophetic coming from the Spirit or a word of encouragement or prayer or whatever it is. And since the congregations have been so used to being passive, you need to do things to facilitate that becoming active. Maybe have meetings where everyone can share for five minutes or let people sing out a song just making up a tune on, on this spontaneously from a psalm or, or sing out a song of love unto God. You know God will guide you. So make it a house of prayer. Make it a place where the body functions freely before Leadership begins to share the word. And I have in this book, God, Headship, and Body Invasion, um, over 250 pages of what you can do in your assembly to bring the invasion of the headship of Christ in fullness into your assembly for these last days that we may go forth in the fullness and the power of the Spirit to reap the harvest around the world. Well, it's a big introduction. What I do to speak prophetically is also keep myself in a heart set and a mindset of worship while I'm speaking. The Word of God says in Revelations 19.10, Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When we worship God in great humility and reverence out of spirit and in truth, and in love for God, we are filled with his spirit in an overflow that can result in creative spirit utterances coming from the spirit of God beyond ourselves. That's what I will seek to do. And one of the other things I do to facilitate that is I cast the lot before God to receive from him the possibility of any chapter from the Bible. And I do it twice to get two chapters that they may bear witness with each other as to the theme and the message that is discovered that is common in those two chapters. And then, today, once a week, I preach from those five chapters that I receive by the casting of the lot. I also cast the lot to receive a hymn today to sing. And so the one we will sing today, and I don't choose hymns that are shallow and meaningless like most churches have in their congregations nowadays. You will find this hymn very beautiful. You can play it on YouTube and on your overhead projector if you're connected to YouTube. And so the th out of the 152 songs that are on my website at loverealize.com, that is love, 
realize.com. This one is the one that I decided to go with, although I did get another one, but I didn't like it. It was not a very good song as far as... And so the Lord allowed me, to, I believe, to get this one. So what I'm going to do is mini, uh, minimize myself as soon as this starts to play. This is a call for the church to wake up that is pretty obvious from this song, and it will be very encouraging for you to hear it and to sing along with it. So here we go. <laughs> Pray. 
this is one of my most favorite songs. It's a song that is calling you to awakening, to find your full purpose and meaning in this world, is to be part of the army of the living God that proclaims the gospel and lives it out. So I will bring myself up to normal size here. Um, I received some very unique messages this time and I'm looking forward to sharing some of the very rich things that God showed me and I should tell you that when I first saw these chapters I thought there's no way there can be a common theme in these two chapters I said God have I sinned or what I mean why is it there can't possibly be a common theme and this happened a number of times and then when I saw the theme it was so obvious and so powerful. And it seems to be that way generally, that when it is harder to see the theme and when you see it, it is so much more strong and confirmed by those two chapters. And so I do look forward to sharing with you the two particular ones that stood out of the many that I received this week that had such a wonderful common theme in them. And so I have just basically pasted in the scriptures that I received by the casting of the lot. So I may not go into some of these, but there's two I'm going to go into and give the message and let God just carry it forth because I don't have any preparation here. So first of all, on Monday, I received Jeremiah 7 and Luke 2. And in these two passages, Israel and Jeremiah resisted the word of God to repent, whereas Mary, in Luke chapter 2, was willing to receive the word of the Lord even when in the end of her life, her soul would be pierced with the pain of seeing her son in the natural crucified before her eyes. Mary was receptive to the word, who is Jesus Christ, from the womb because she totally received what that angel said to her without unbelief, unlike the man that went into the temple, the high priest that went into the temple and saw the angel telling him about the birth of John. So from the womb to the sword of God's truth and the purposes at the cross that God had through allowing that painful experience that Mary went through. And of course, the disciples went through it too because they thought at that time that the kingdom of God was going to take over the Roman Empire and immediately appear. So this is not the passage I'm going to spend a long time speaking on. So I'm going to skip all of this here. It's just a basically... God's judgment upon Israel because of their ways. Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, and it goes on, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. But what do they do? Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. I won't go on. And then, of course, I've described the birth of Mary. And I did get other scripture, which I don't have time to go into right here. So we'll skip that and go to the next one, and we will eventually um, get into things more strongly. It's very interesting that I have been receiving by the casting of Lot, Joel chapter 2, quite a few times. Last week, I think I might have received it once or twice, I've forgotten. It is here, and it might even be here later on, I don't know. But it was one I re sought for because I wanted more insight, because at first I wasn't seeing what God was wanting to say, see, say through John chapter 5 and Ezra 3. But in all of these chapters are about receptivity, just like the other ones that I just mentioned, Mary's receptivity to the word of God and to God's dwelling with and in them. 
In Ezra, the people had to put up the altar and offer before the people that they feared would possibly attack them. That was the first thing they did before they began to build the temple. They put up an altar. And it says they feared the people of those lands while they were putting up that altar. And this was for the laying of the foundation of the temple. In John 5, they could not receive the word of God into them because they did not seek God's honor, but honor from one another. God is calling us as his people to be those that are in this hour courageous to put our lives on the altar even before our false accusers and those that would mock us as was the case with the nation of Israel. It says in Ezra 3, 2, then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings, morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, that is, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. I already mentioned in John 5 8, one of the verses. <clears throat> and it is in John 5, 42 to 47. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So a person can come before people that has a motive to seek their honor, so he will say the things that please their ears. And they will put their identity in that person. And this happens over and over again. An example is Hitler. All the masses are all cheering Hitler. And look at he did. He led them. He came from the pit of hell. And he led them to total destruction. And he wanted all the glory and the honor. Yes, he had a zeal for his nation. But it was all around an idealism that exalted him and his buddies. And how wicked they were to destroy people's lives just so they could have the power. A general principle that now is happening on a global scale in so many institutions and government organizations around the world. And the common people see it. And I could go in and talk a lot more about this. But I want to get eventually to the chapters that I believe God wants me, the two, two days that God wants me to do more on. And it's this one starting on Wednesday and then on Thursday. Those two are very powerful. And so I want to go into that. On Wednesday, I received Joshua 5 and Luke 24. Both of these chapters have the common theme about rolling away basically what you could call the death or the emptiness of the past. That's the sins and the emptiness of our lives because of being deceived by sin. Rolling that away. The place called Gilgal means rolling away. And so I want to read here without, and so I show the Hebrew words here showing that that's what that means. It means a wheel as well. And I could go into the symbolic letters in the Hebrew. You got the ge, which is people gathering around something. And often when there's someone in the center and they gather around, it does form a circle like a wheel. Often animals will, in the masses like reindeer and so on, start 
going in circles and they will be in a wheel. And the word lamid is a word that's like a shepherd's staff to hook a sheep, to hook something in. And then it repeats. And so you got a wheel repeating, going around and around. And it means something to, be, to, to roll off something. A wheel can roll something off. And so we read in Joshua 5, 1 to 9. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time Yahweh said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, and all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of Yahweh. Unto whom... Yahweh swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day, which means rolling away. There comes a point in our lives of decision. We may have been in the wilderness in our lives for a long time due to the deceptions of our own heart, but we come to the end of ourselves even in a sense like the prodigal son. We become those that are purged of the deception like Jacob, which means he will take by the heel. Deceiver was purged from being a deceiver and was then named Israel, which means he will be a prince of God. Jacob went through an unraveling process of deception. He came to a point of crisis in his life where it looked like he was going to lose his life and all his hopes and dreams and his wife's and his children and everything because he was about to face Esau. But before he faced Esau, that night as he was in his tent alone and he had sent all of them away to be safe so that if Esau did attack, at least they'd have a chance to escape. He wrestles with a man all night, which is the angel of the Lord, whose name is secret and is called wonderful, yes. And in the end, he prevailed. He would not let him go until he was blessed. So though Jacob had deception in his life, he also was someone that had hunger for God and would not let go of what was really valuable. And he came to a point where he was broken in his soul through prevailing to the point that he couldn't prevail. And he was touched in the hollow of his thigh. Outwardly, there was a breaking of him from walking, which was symbolic of God breaking the deception in his life. 
that he would no longer be a deceiver that takes by the heel, but would be one that would walk in uprightness with God. He prevailed. There was at that point of crisis a place where he looks into the face of the angel and he says he saw the face of God, which is the word pineal, I believe, there in the Hebrew. I have had a crisis in my life in the past which I forbear to describe for time here. I've only had one open vision in my life. It happened when I was young in 1975. At about one in the morning when there was two people, no, three people with me, Jean and her husband, another name, man by the name of Dennis. And I had two pressures. One was great condemnation. The devil was condemning and saying, I'm not worthy of the mercy of God. And that this other fellow, Dennis, will take my place and I will be like King Saul. That's the condemnation I was under. I'm going to be like the children of Israel that died in the wilderness because I had temptation and lust in my life and was having such a struggle trying to control that in my 20s, desiring a wife and not finding one. I don't know why the churches couldn't help us find wives when we were young people. What I had to go through and the struggles. But nevertheless, the other was a great hunger and thirst for God and I was fasting and praying at that time with them and suddenly the room filled with light and I'd been praying for God to give me a revelation of Christ because I said I've received the baptism and the Holy Spirit but your word says if we keep your commandments you will reveal the son to us and I said I've not had this Lord reveal the son to me and at that time without going into the details the whole room filled with light and the others knew something was happening too. And Jean, the wife of Ed, was part of the vision. Her face started filling with wrinkles really fast because I loved her. She was, And yet I didn't dare touch her because I loved her husband. But she was crazy about me and very spiritual. She went on a 40-day fast and she won many people to Christ and I really looked up to her and she was very attractive to me too, but I would not dare touch her. And so, for Ed's sake, because I didn't want to hurt Ed and I didn't want to sin against God. And so at that point, all I can say without going into the details is I wasn't looking at her face. Eventually I was looking at someone else's face and it was the face of a captain with a very serious stare. And I wanted to smile back in my flesh, but he didn't smile back. But there was such love in his eyes. My flesh wanted to smile back because it was so like I was being pierced right through my inner being. His face was entering my being and it was causing me to die. I felt like I was going to die. It was like weakness was in me and I was... If I keep looking, I'm going to physically die. That's what it felt like. And I saw how holy God was. But I also saw that I was his son, and the enemy was condemning me and saying I was not this, his son, that I wasn't worthy to be his son. And so he gave me the verse, you're complete in him. And he gave me the other verse, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And I knew then that I was his son, and I let out a great wail of relief. And I experienced myself being burned at the stake as a martyr and going up in flames to God. And it was a very beautiful and rapturous experience. And I knew I was his son, that I was not condemned. This was a very powerful vision I had. And I, oft, I don't often share it. But this is similar to Jacob here and his encounter with his angel. There comes a point where there's a rolling away in our lives and it doesn't just happen once. There's varying degrees of conversion as we continue to seek God and prevail. There will be the rolling off, the rolling off that will happen, that will bring us into a higher plane of fellowship with God. 
Now we continue to read here the other chapter, which was with this chapter, and it is in Joshua chapter 10, pardon me, chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal. That was the other one I got by the casting of Lot. And kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So here again, there's a new beginning that happens. It happens at Gilgal, rolling away. It's, the rolling away happened when they crossed the Jordan and they left that life behind, just like Jacob left his life-serving Laban behind, which is a symbol of serving Egypt and the world. And they begin to enter the promised land. And then what do we read? And he said, nay. So Joshua now is his men are behind him maybe by a hundred yards. He wants to be alone. So he goes up ahead alone before his army, who would always be probably guarding him. And he said, and there's this man standing before him, and he doesn't know who he is, and he's got a sword drawn. And so he says to him, and he said, nay. And he says, are you with us or against us? And this man with a sword drawn says, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord? That's Adonai unto his servant and the captain of Yahweh's host said unto Joshua, which would be Yeshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. God is calling us as his people to be prepared to come in to battle as the song we sung indicated. He wants us to wake up out of our sleep, out of our ease, and to have the sword of the Spirit pierce the depths of our soul. That is the sword of the light of the trumpet sounding voice of the Spirit of God to pierce the depths of our soul with a circumcision in our heart that will cause his fire to be kindled in us that might be birthed through us the sword of the Spirit that we could pull it out of the sheath of our soul and speak it forth in this hour. And he is calling the body of Christ to prophesy as never before in the meetings and to begin to facilitate and to practice prophesying in corporate assembly for it is his will that we all prophesy that is speaking as the oracles of God. That is what God is calling in this hour for. And when we come into a unity of the knowledge of of the faith of the Son of God and are baptized in his love because we've repented of loving the world and we come into the fullness of the headship of Christ, the power and the authority to reap that harvest and to conquer the powers of darkness will be beyond what we can ask or think. It calls for us to be fearless and courageous. And when we know a love relationship with God that is full and complete, we know what it says in 1 John 5, that perfect love casts out fear. It should be a common practice for us to know a deep turning in our heart that rends our heart. It says in 2 Corinthians 3, the last verse in the original Greek, I'm saying it more that way than in the King James, it says whenever the heart 
shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Do we know what it is to turn with uprightness and humility out of the fear of God, to know the practice in a life of prayer of the deep turning of our heart that brings that circumcision, that releases the light of the Spirit of God to pierce our inner being with illumination and light that will rise up and unleash in our soul the sword of the Spirit to come forth in prophecy, prophecy that also can speak and declare things that bring down the works of the enemy. That is what God is asking for in this hour. That is what he's asking for. Now, I cast lots this day, and I got a third chapter that also confirmed again these other two chapters that I got by the casting of the lot. I hope... Did I? I just want to double check something here. Sometimes, no, it was only two. I only got Joshua 5, pardon me. And then the next chapter I got that confirmed it was Luke 24. And the key verse there in Luke 24 was verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. The word rolled away is again in this chapter. In both of these chapters, the word rolled away appears. Gilgal means rolling away. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Brothers and sisters, the significance of this stone being rolled away is this is that we have been shut up and, as it were, having our grave clothes on. We have not been moving in the spirit of prophecy because of the loves of the world and the entanglements of this world that are like the grave clothes. And God is calling us in this hour to be those that come into a higher plane. I have struggled in my own life with certain weaknesses where because I'm single and I want a wife and I've had a desire to wife all my life, I've found there's this tendency that when I love a woman, I love her so much that when another one comes along that's way better, I don't care anymore and I don't even care if the woman is ugly because I love her so much. And yet God doesn't want me to be so set on her. And I had to have go through a lot of unraveling and heartbreak of being rejected by women that I loved. And it was very hard. It was very hard to go through it. Through, throughout that, for all these years, and I'm 74 years old, but very young in body because I know a lot about anti-aging medicine and how to apply it. But that was not easy. But even recently, the Spirit of God was saying unto me, don't dwell anymore in that realm. You are now mature, and that is immaturity. Walk in this new maturity. And that new maturity is a plane that does not allow confinement, that has caused a rolling away of the confinements of deception from the past. And God is calling us as his people to also come into such a place with him. And so we know the account here is that Jesus Christ is discovered to be risen from the dead. And that is what God is wanting us to do in this hour, to be in full identification with the resurrection of Christ, with, our, with us as a new creation, that we are sons and daughters of God and not to let the enemy lie to us and condemn us like he did to Joshua the high priest in Zechariah 3, where he's clothed with filthy garments and Satan is at his right hand condemning him. And yes, he's hungry for God. He's waiting on God. But his garments are filthy because the enemy's lying to him. And he's believing those lies. He's buying into them in a certain degree that is causing the garments to be confined, to be filthy. But because he perseveres, there comes a point where the accuser of the brethren is cast down and he's put on beautiful garments. And like the prodigal son, he comes to his father and the father gives him a ring and he gives him clean garments 
and he knows now that he is his son, and he will never dwell anymore in the gutter because he's seen the emptiness of it. He knows what he's been forgiven of, what he's been saved from. And as the word of God says, those that have been forgiven much love the Lord much. And sometimes those that have been brought forth like myself, being righteous from my childhood, seeking God, go through a process such as I have gone through, where this is the experience, such as Joshua the high priest, so that the one that has been righteous can rejoice with the one that has been saved out of the world, such as the prostitutes and the harlots and those that have been very wicked. And they both are together in unity in the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I want to go on to Thursday because I received some things that are very powerful on Thursday. And I will close with after I go through this message as well. I received Levit Leviticus 4 and Acts 16. And for the life of me, I could not see how there could be any common theme between those, those two chapters. But when I saw it, wow. And so, what do we find in Leviticus 4 and Acts 16? In both of these chapters, people committed a sin through ignorance. In Leviticus 4, we see the sin of ignorance is due to not giving diligence to bind our lives to the horns of the altar. It is also due to the lack of worship seen in the blood being sprinkled seven times before the altar of incense. The burning of the fat on the altar is the burning of the ease or laziness. This lack affects the mind of the heart and of the brain to believe and make choices out of blindness or self-deception, which is shown in the burning of the heads and legs and inward parts of the bullock outside the camp. That is what I saw in Leviticus 4, and I will go into it in more detail. The other chapter that goes with this chapter is Acts 16. So I want to point out Acts 16 now before I go in to more depth into Leviticus chapter 4. And particularly, I want to point out, I guess I will, I will start here. Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And of course, I will skip this and go down to verse 37 because here's what is the same on the sin of ignorance. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly on condemned being Romans and have cast us into prison and now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the surgeons, sergeants told these words unto the magistrates and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. See, they committed a sin of ignorance against these people. They should have checked out that they were Romans and then they wouldn't have beaten them, but they didn't. So they committed an act of ignorance that resulted in a serious threat to their own positions. But the ones that interceded on their behalf and delivered them was the sacrifice that Paul and Silas and the others paid by being beaten and whipped in prison and yet they did not allow those circumstances to put them in a position of despair. Rather, they triumphed and worshipped God in their affliction. I want to point out here now, going back to Leviticus, 
the symbolisms in Leviticus that are so significant. First of all, I want to point out that it describes binding the sacrifice, it describes the sacrifice and the horns of the altar. And in Revelations 19.13, the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. So we know that the horns of the altar is where the voice of God can sound forth from those horns. A voice came out of the horns of the altar. It also says this in Psalms 118, 26 to 27. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you out of the house of Yahweh. God, that is Elohim, the Almighty's. No, in this case, I think is El, is the Yahweh. The Almighty is Yahweh, which hath showed us light, buying the sacrifice with cords, even onto the horns of the altar. Now, having read those two verses, let us now go to the chapter we received by Lot. <laughs> To, to illuminate the significance of what we see in Leviticus 4. It says, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before Yahweh, before the veil of the sanctuary. Now we know the veil was rent in two when Christ arose from the dead. And we know that the veil is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. The people that want to enter in to the most and greatest and purest intimacy with God will be those so will not be those that commit sins of ignorance. Because when you are in a close relationship with God, there is the spirit of a diligence and awakening that illuminates you to any area that could go in a path of presumption that leads to sin. King David said, keep me from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And the sprinkling of the blood before the veil is an understanding of the perfection that is needed in our walk with God, and it does involve our repentance, asking Christ to cleanse us where we have lacked in our love, being wholehearted for God. And then we can enter into a dimension of intimacy with God, which is represented in the Holy of Holies. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. Now that's different than the sacrifice being bound to the horns of the altar. I know that. But the bullock was bound to the horns of the altar as well. Here we have the horns of the altar of sweet incense, which is in the Holy of Holies, and blood is applied to it, which is the tabernacle of the congregation and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
and he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the cull above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away, as it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of burnt offering. And this is representative of us, because it represents the fat and being at ease and of release and so on. It represents us laying down laziness and putting on the spirit of diligence to have our heart skirt about with diligence. And the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung, even the whole of the bullock shall he carry forth without the camp. Just moving it up further here a bit. Without the camp onto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt. So what is the symbolism of all this? If we want to hear the voice of the Lord, which comes from the horns of the altar, God wants us to know what it is to be diligent enough to bind our lives on the altar before him. Like I preached earlier, where they did not start the temple until they first set up the altar, which they were fearful to set up because of those that were threatening around them. But they set it up despite that, and they bound the sacrifice to the horns of the altar. The secret to hearing the voice of God is to come to a place in our heart where we are willing to bind our lives to the altar for the joy that is set before us, for the realization of how great God's love is to us so that we are captured by his love to the place of total relinquishment. It talks about hearing God's voice in Isaiah, and I don't know the exact chapter right now, but it says, you have opened my ears to hear, and it's in relation to him yielding his body. I believe it's in the context of sacrifice and offering. Thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared me. And it's speaking of Christ giving his body and prophetic utterance in Isaiah. And God is calling us as his people in this hour to be those that enter into this intimacy with God. That intimacy was very strongly revealed as Paul and Silas worshipped God while they were being persecuted. Right there, the fact that they were willing to worship God was a binding of their lives to, out of love for God, to the altar that released the power of God to break the bonds that were holding them captive and allow the word of God to go forth so that the captain of the ward was converted in his household, so that the people that persecuted them recognized their wrong and wanted to do them diligence in the opposite of persecuting them. God is calling us as his people in this hour to be those that have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying because our love for Christ is a love slave love. It is like the all of the slave that says, I love my master, I love my Lord, I will not go free. And they put an all through his ear, representing hearing hearing, hearing, 
and obeying the bidding of the Spirit of God to do as God is calling us to do, knowing that he will give us the grace to overcome all things and all fear and to conquer. And when Israel entered the promised land, there was a rolling off of the old that was replaced with new food as well. It was very delicious. But they had to cross the Jordan. They had to come to a place where they were willing to face those giants that were probably many of them 12 feet tall, knowing that it wasn't them and their own might that would conquer, but that they could trust God and be fearless. And much of the reason that we don't have victory in our lives is because of the grasping tendency towards the things of this life that we think are going to bring fulfillment, which is a consciousness of loss. And that is what causes uptightness. It says that perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And the root of that torment is consciousness of loss. And what replaces it is the awareness of the fullness of our love for God and of his love for us, that we realize we are complete in him and that we are his sons, and that we walk in a life of holiness that releases that authority in our lives. To prophesy, to speak out of a relationship that hears from the horns of the altar, that hears from the altar of incense horns that we come to with incense before God. We know that intimacy with him. And that is what he's calling. And that is what he is saying today. And I cannot go on to what I received in Friday for time. I will just simply say that the two, the common theme, I'll read what the common theme was on Friday between John 7 and Galatians 5. Both chapters have the issue of circumcision brought up. It is entrusting in ritual performance like circumcision that is wrong. It is rightly perceiving God in the holiness and mercy of his love that births the response of genuine faith in God. Faith works by love, first towards God and then towards others. This results in walking in the spirit, which overcomes walking in the flesh. So brothers and sisters, thank you for listening to this message and God bless you all. Amen. And by the way, I do want you to support me by purchasing my book. I'm at a very low point financially right now. I don't even know if I want to tell you, but all I got on May the 11th is $109 in my bank account. I got to make it through the whole month. And I'm trusting God. I would appreciate if some of you would purchase my book. It will bless you on the afterlife or on Godheadship and Body Invasion. Or there is a place in loverealize.com where you can just put in a contribution. No, I'm not a nonprofit at this time. But if you contribute towards me, it is good. I, I, my whole life is given to just serving Christ. I don't find pleasure in this world. I find pleasure in living for God. So I'm believing God to get me through this time of need. I am doing things on the internet. And uh, so... Some of that will bear fruit, and if I can get my books up and properly marketed on Amazon, they're very high-quality books, better than the bestseller I know. No, it doesn't have a star rating because it hasn't been marketed, and I'm not a well-known person, and I didn't do it right. But I may change that in the future, and it may, things may take off. And I have other books on the fear of God and others that I have pretty well written that I want to publish. But in the meantime, I would appreciate your support that God would begin to bring forth this vision to conquer your nation in the United States and my nation in Canada and the nations of the world. This is more important and all the other stuff is important, making sure there's integrity in the elections and that all these people are held to account. Very important. But the most important thing is what I'm talking about that needs to happen in our lives individual and, individually and corporately. Thank you for listening to this message.